I'd like to call the meeting of the Senate Health and Human Services Committee to order. Um, it's Friday, March 17th, 2023. Uh, we do have a quorum present, and uh, we are going to take up bills. We might have to rearrange the order on some things today because we have um, bill authors who have other commitments. And so we are going to go to Senate File 2088, which is Senator Abler's bill. Uh, thank you. Welcome, thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Abler. Um, does this stay here by the time we're, this is way live? Um, is this bill going to stay in your committee? We, yes, we will okay. lay it over. Well, that makes it easy. Anyway, so uh, every so often there's a way to innovate, doing a project, in this case, uh, doing SNAP training makes a lot of sense. Um, Noka County and others uh, have figured out a way. And so to stay brief, Madam Chair, I'll just turn it over to my testifier who can tell you all the details. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Jessica Leth. I'm the Director of Economic Assistance for Anoka County. The hiring and retention of financial work workers has been a concern for many years, but this concern has grown with the increase in work counties have experienced during the pandemic and with the restarting of annual renewals and public health care programs, the need for counties to be fully staffed is critical. Under the current training structure, when a county hires a new financial worker, they are required to attend training through the, Depart the Department of Human Services to learn the basics of program policy and receive access to state systems. The training is typically offered one time per month by a schedule set by the Department of Human Services and is capped at 20 seats for all 87 counties and tribes. If a training is offered only one time per month, the training dates and available slots may not align with the county's hiring needs. This is a challenge when counties are experiencing multiple vacancies coupled with an unprecedented amount of work. There have been numerous times throughout the years when Anoka County has had to pass up qualified applicants because they had a conflict with the timing of the Department of Human Services training or there are not enough training slots available. Anoka County is not unique in this experience. Many colleagues in other counties have experienced the same issues when trying to fill vacancies and train their employees. Wright County experienced a period where due to various circumstances, they did not have staff who were trained in family cash or child care assistance programs and DHS was either not offering the training in those programs or the classes were full at that time. If we are limited to set training dates and a cap on training seats available through DHS, we will continue to have many vacancies for months to come. Anoka County currently has multiple vacancies in this position. Many of the large counties that do have the resources and interest to do in-house training already have an intensive training program for new staff that is done in addition to the Department of Human Services training. We also recognize that there are many counties that do not have the capacity to provide in-house training and rely on DHS to provide this training. By allowing larger counties to train in-house, um, we will open up more slots for the Department of Human Services training for these counties that are unable to train in-house. So I'm here before you to ask for support of Senate File 2088. This is a one-year pilot that would allow counties to train certain programs in-house um, so we can hire and retain our staff. Thank you. Thank you. We're not. Okay. Thank you for your testimony, and I appreciated being able to, to talk with you was a week ago or whenever it was a few days ago to hear about. Um, and it does seem like um, you know a, a pilot of this approach. Um, I'm sympathetic to the fact that there are so many people that you need to get trained, and and we want to facilitate. Uh, the county's work um, as well as we can. Senator Abler. Well, thank you. And it's ironic that in this time of even greater need by some folks, the, the training to get the stuff to the people is what's the barrier, not even the fact that they're eligible or all that. And so uh, this is being worked on. Uh, there's a, an amendment that will be coming before this bill is ready to be adopted into your whatever omnibus or whatever. But um, it just seems like it's reasonable. And there's some question about federal stuff or not. And like, well, in the department, and we will sort through that. But um, at least you have the idea, the, the premise of the bill. You have most of the bill in front of you. And we'll keep working and keep you on the loop. Thank you. Um, members, any questions? 
Uh, we have several members, and I maybe should have pointed that out to start with. We do have um, several members on the remote link today. So um, Senator Bolden, Senator Kupek, and Senator Liskey are up on remotely. So um, if I don't see or hear anyone asking questions, thank you, Senator Ebler, and thank you, Ms. Leth, and we will um, lay the spill over for possible inclusion. Very nice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks for accommodating the time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Next, we will move to Senator Bolden has several bills on the agenda and so start with, okay. And we will start with Senate file 1008. Senator Bolden, this is critical access dental infrastructure program establishment and appropriation. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. And I'll just um, start with a thank you for the opportunity to be remote. I'll just a note that we all wish COVID was over, but um, it is not. And it continues to disproportionately affect families like mine who have folks with disabilities and folks who are immunocompromised. So appreciate the opportunity to present remotely. So I'm grateful uh, to be able to present House uh, Senate, Senate File 1008, which is around dental care, which um, is, uh, we'll hear um, more about today as, as I have a second uh, bill about dental care, but an important part of healthcare. And we have some gaps across the state in terms of making sure that everyone has access to the dental care that they need. Um, and so this is a bill to, um, it, to create some um, grants and forgivable loan programs for those who are offering critical access dental care. And so um, this is folks across the state um, and the, the critical access dental care it is access for those on our public programs. And so these are um, two thirds of the, of the care provided across our state, um, but there's a shortfall. There's a significant shortfall to be able sh to be sure that all the Minnesotans who need care are able to get it. And so this is it, not a, a fix all, but it, it is one um, piece, one step to get us closer to that, to making sure that people are getting the preventative dental care that they need. And we know that offering and ensuring that people are getting preventative dental care is um, not only the right thing to do, but it is more cost effective. And so um, it prevents folks from ending up in the emergency room um, with dental emergencies. Uh, it is much more cost effective to be sure that people are getting regular cleanings. Um, the goal is for 55% of the population to get a cleaning once a year. Um, and we are not, uh, we are not there. And so, um, like I said, this is this is one step to get us closer to that. And so um, with that, I will turn it over to testifiers, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Bolden. Um, we have a testifier who is also online, Jean Edival Larson. And if you can um, state your name. Oh, and state your name and begin your testimony. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Yes, my name is Jean Larson, and I'm the Executive Director of Northern Dental Access Center in Beltrami and Norman Counties. Our two clinics host more than 30,000 patient encounters each year, all low-income people from across the entire swath of northwestern Minnesota. Our unique model of tapping into regional dentists has helped us succeed in building a current patient base of over 40,000 people in need. Recent investments to increased Medicaid reimbursements for dental have supported the financial sustainability of our safety net operations, yet those funds do not provide sufficient resources for needed capital or infrastructure investment. In this severe dental health professional shortage area, there are no private practice dental offices taking new Medicaid patients, and those of us in the safety net dental space have also had to curb the acceptance of new patients. Even after three major expansions here at Northern Dental Access Center, our physical, clinical capacity simply cannot accommodate more patient traffic. Medicaid enrollment in our region has increased over 20% since COVID. Currently, almost 95,000 people within driving distance of either of our clinics um, are enrolled in a Minnesota health care plan. Both of our clinics are at full capacity. 
serving a current patient base of over 43,000 people and providing care for those who already rely on us still requires waits of over six months. This, these 43,000 people who we are serving make up less than half of the Minnesota health care plan enrollees in our region. We've have, we have multiple opportunities to expand our services in other communities in our region, but without substantial capital investment, those opportunities will pass us by. Regional foundation support is very limited in rural Minnesota, and their interest or capacity for major uh, funding is simply non-existent. The capital infrastructure and workforce development grant programs and uh, loan forgiveness programs in this bill would provide essential resources to critical access dental providers and provide a huge return on investment for the legislature as it looks to increase access to dental care for Minnesotans enrolled in public programs. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you very, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, Senator Bolden, I um, understand that you have an amendment, the A1 amendment. Do you want to talk about that and, and we can adopt that author's amendment? Yes, Madam Chair, I would move the A1 amendment. And um, Council will, we will have that passed out. It's not in our, our member packets. Is there, um, can you provide a description for us? Yes, Madam Chair, I can. Um, just pulling it up myself. Um, it is mainly technical, Madam Chair. Um, it just... Um, it, it looks like it uh, adds the Dental Workforce Development Program and an appropriation for that workforce development program? Yes, that is correct, Madam Chair. Um, yes, that is correct. Thank you. And question for Council, are the appropriations, are they separate from, um, I'm just was looking at the bill itself, or are these kind of combined? Can you tell us about the appropriations, Mr. Uh, Mahan? Madam Chair, members, it's two separate appropriations. The first one is for the um, infrastructure grants that are in the underlying bill. And paragraph B is a new appropriation for uh, the workforce development program that's in the amendment. I'll also note that the appropriation for the infrastructure portion of the bill where the language is in the underlying bill uh, is increased by $5 million. Okay, thank you. Any other, any questions before we vote on that amendment? Um, Senator Bolden moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Bolden, did you have any additional comments about the bill? Uh, I would just um, ask for members' support. There's, um, you know, significant needs uh, related to dental care across the state, and this is, as I said, one one um, effort to increase access for folks, and um, you know, for the for the people who are providing that care to give them a little more resources to be able to take on. Um, you know, to provide more access for folks because there are significant, significant wait lists across the state. Members, are there any questions? Senator Atkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, this one, um, Mr. Monahan, uh, just maybe for a little clarity, I'm on, well, if, we, if we're on the amendment, um, subdivision three under eligible pro projects, and the last sentence where it says, serve Minnesota health care program enrollees. This program is for MA and Minnesota care, I would assume. Um, does that language cover that, or would that make people think that people on a state, like a CGIP policy or something, a state plan, would, would there be any confusion with inclusion? Mr. Ronahan? Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Utke, um, there shouldn't be confusion 
Uh, this term, Minnesota Health Care Programs, is a term that DHS often uses. Its use in statute is inconsistent, um, but uh, it is intended to refer to the programs you mentioned, among some other ones as well. But yes, state-funded programs. OK. Um, Senator Efke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, so if <laughs> it kind of sounds like it works, but it could be better, because that's when I read it, I kind of wondered if this was wide open. So uh, my question was going to be if we need to tighten it up. But uh, I'll leave that up to um, council to have the right words in there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other member questions? No. Hearing none from the um, online, uh, Senator Bolden, any final comments? Uh, no, Madam Chair, just uh, would appreciate member support. This is attempting to get at a, at a critical health care need across our state. Thank you, and it does, it does seem like we have a very critical need. Um, this bill will be laid over for possible inclusion in a future bill. Next, we will go to uh, Senate file 1948. Senator Seeberger is here. Welcome to the committee, Senator Seeberger. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm pleased to be here on Senate file 1948, um, which is all about connecting patients with the right treatment at the right time. As precision medicine becomes the standard of care in treatment for diseases like cancer, mental health, and autoimmune diseases, biomarker testing has risen in, in importance as the gateway to many of these therapies. Biomarker testing is the analysis of a patient's tissue, blood, or biospecimen for the presence of a biomarker. Biomarker testing is not a screening tool. It is not genetic testing or comparable to tests like 23andMe. There is robust medical and scientific evidence to demonstrate the effectiveness of biomarker testing. The bill before you lays out clear parameters requiring coverage only for tests that will benefit patients. Timely access to comprehensive biomarker testing means more patients can access the most tr effective treatments for their disease. More effective treatments means better outcomes, improved quality of life, and reduced costs as we avoid unnecessary or ineffective treatment. The bill before you would require state regulated insurers, medical assistance, and Minnesota Care to cover biomarker testing when testing meets medical and scientific evidence standards defined in the bill. In Minnesota, some insurers are already covering much of this testing. This is about making sure plans play by the same rules and keep up with the science so that patients get the testing they need for the right treatment at the right time. I'd like to share with the committee why I am carrying this bill. Um, as some of you may know, maybe some of you do not, uh, one of my sons has significant mental illness uh, issues and autism. We, for many years, struggled to find the right combination of mental health medications that would effectively um, help manage his condition and allow him to be a healthy and happy and productive kid. And as some of you may know, finding that right mix of medications is a, timely pro a very time-consuming process um, and often unsuccessful. After many years of trial and error on different medications, one of his providers suggested biomarker testing to see if we couldn't pinpoint a medication that would be effective the first time. Um, we did that, but it wasn't covered by our insurance and we paid for it out of pocket. I wanna say it was around five to $7,000, I can't remember, but it was, thousand, it was in that range. Um, we paid it, we could, um, but so many people couldn't. It did identify a medication, and that medication, as it turns out, was very effective. So it, it, it worked really well in our case. Um, I know that this testing works. I know that it's effective. And for me, it's personal. That's why I'm, I'm carrying this bill. I'd also like to thank Senators Abler and Morrison for co-authoring and Senator Utke for starting this conversation and carrying this bill last year. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to my first testifier if the uh, committee is ready. 
Thank you. Um, yes, if I have um, Emily Myatt and um, Terry Fisher. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name's Emily Myatt. I'm the Regional Government Relations Director for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, and I'm here today to express coalition support for Senate File 1948. I had biomarker testing when I was first diagnosed with an early stage cancer 13 years ago. I recently met with an oncologist who specializes in my rare type of cancer, and he told me that since biomarker testing has evolved, a test today might have told me and my oncologist that I didn't need to have half my colon removed as a 19-year-old sophomore in college. But this bill isn't just about cancer patients and oncology. It's about lupus, ALS, mental health, or arthritis. It's about the research happening in biomarker testing for Alzheimer's and heart disease. This is about making sure current and future patients can access the right treatment at the right time. In your packet, you'll find a letter of support from more than 40 organizations, from hospitals to medical professionals and to other patient advocacy groups. Um, and there's also written testimony from medical experts and providers that couldn't join us today because they were stuck uh, with clinic duty. The bill has gone through the mandate review process. That report found despite evidence to support the use of certain biomarker tests, insurance coverage varies and that variation isn't always based on clinical practice guidelines. Um, additionally, the bill, um, which would level the playing field, ensuring consistent coverage across state regulated insurers, would result in a premium impact, but it's nine to 22 cents per member per month in the first year. And this doesn't take into account potential cost savings getting patients connected to effective treatment or avoiding unnecessary treatment can save um, unnecessary side effects and symptoms and of course healthcare costs. Finally, there is a widening racial, geographic, and socioeconomic gap for those that do and don't have access to this type of testing. Consistent coverage for biomarker testing is key to reducing health disparities, improving patient quality of life, and potentially reducing costs. Thank you. Thank you for Thank you for your testimony. Um, trying again, it doesn't sound like it's turning on. It says it's on, the light's on, but it doesn't sound like it's on. Um, well, we'll t move. Um, Ms. Fisher, if you can um, state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Terry Fisher. I live in Minneapolis. I was diagnosed with stage 4 metastatic lung cancer in 2021. Because of biomarker testing and the targeted treatment that it led to, I'm currently cancer-free. Before my diagnosis, I had a persistent cough that I wasn't that worried about. I was doing CrossFit, I was very active, I was otherwise really healthy, but my cough would not go away. My doctor first diagnosed me with asthma, but this didn't make sense to me and the inhaler that he gave me wasn't doing anything. I had to advocate for myself to get a CT scan against that doctor's wishes. As I waited for the scan results, I thought maybe I had bronchitis. I knew it was something, but never in my wildest dreams did I imagine that I would be diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. I went through a bronchoscopy and a biopsy of my lung and pleura, and that confirmed that I was stage four. The next step would be chemo, unless I had a biomarker that gave me access to a new targeted medication. My biomarker test showed a mutation which made me eligible for this medication. It's been a little over a year since I started this targeted therapy. I've tolerated it really well, and my cancer is eradicated for now. Today is my daughter's birthday, and I'm so lucky to be able to celebrate it with her. Because of biomarker testing, my treatment was precise, and I didn't have to have chemotherapy. Think of the symptoms and side effects that saved me from. I have a young family, we're busy and active, and this year has meant everything to me. I don't know how long my treatment will last, but I'm so grateful for biomarker testing if my cancer does progress, I can look for another marker and hopefully find another targeted medication. My insurance covered biomarker testing, but other Minnesotans aren't as lucky, and luck shouldn't have anything to do with it. Senate file 1948 makes sure more Minnesotans can access the right treatment at the right time, helping to avoid unnecessary treatment and have a better quality of life 
and have more time with their family and friends. Thank you for listening to my story, and please support this legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for your testimony. This one doesn't seem to be working either. And I, I think that maybe the microphones are working like broadcasting, but not here in the room. So um, I appreciate the testimony. Uh, members, do you have any questions about the bill? Um, seeing any other questions, I really I appreciate your bringing this forward. Yeah, and I, I appreciate you bringing the bill forward. I think this, as medical, take advantage of them. It is so meaningful for people and you know, for their outcomes. And, you know, if we'd look at cost savings to people getting the right treatment um, right away. So uh, thank you for bringing the bill forward. If there's no other questions, then I will, uh, we will lay the bill over for possible inclusion. Next, uh, we will move to Senate file 1249, which is also Senator Seberger's bill. Go ahead and present your bill, Senator Seberger. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, mm -hmm. thank you for the opportunity to uh, present Senate File 1249 today. This is a bill that continues our ongoing work to ensure that our state laws reflect national best, best practices for victims of sexual assault. Before we get started, there have been a number of groups that I've been working with on this bill, and I'd like to acknowledge them here. Um, this includes the Minnesota Sheriff's Association, the Office of Justice Programs, Minnesota Hospital Association, Sexual Assault Nurse Examiners, SANE Program Coordinators, Minnesota Department of Health, and the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Senate File 1249 does two things. First, it proposes the creation of a state administered fund to pay healthcare systems for the medical forensic examinations they provide to sexual assault victims. Currently, payment for sexual assault exams in the state is the responsibility of the county where the sexual assault took place. The county payor system has resulted in several different challenges for healthcare systems, county administrators, and victim survivors. A state-administered fund will clarify the existing confusion on a variety of fronts. Payments will be uniform so hospitals can effectively budget and have confidence regarding how to receive payment for the services they have provided. The counties will no longer have to determine how much to budget for sexual assault exams, resulting in increased administrative efficiency. And finally, victim survivors can be assured with confidence what exactly will be paid for by the state fund. The state fund approach will help ensure that victim survivors are not billed in error or surprised by a bill refused by a county payor. Senate File 1249 will accomplish greater efficiency and equity for our counties, hospitals, and victim survivors across the state. Second, the bill clarifies the best practices for medical forensic exams. It ensures that victims of sexual assault in our state receive the best care and interventions. The bill also ensures that evidence collected at these exams is tested in a timely manner. Criminal investigations can move more quickly, and victims can experience the closure of knowing their kit has been tested to completion. All these important changes promote efficiency and equity for victim survivors, for hospitals, and for our 87 counties throughout the state. Madam Chair, I have one testifier here today, uh, Brianna Heisterkamp, who is the clinical care supervisor at Hennepin Healthcare. There should also be two letters included in your packet um, in support of the, this bill. 
Thank you. I'll just try try one more microphone. Um, this one doesn't seem like it's working either. Is it? It do. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. And I, Brianna Heisterkamp. Um, yes. Please state your name for the record and provide your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Brianna Heisterkamp. I'm a forensic nurse examiner, and I'm the supervisor of the Hennepin Assault Response Team at Hennepin Healthcare. We are a forensic nursing program, primarily providing care to survivors of all ages who have been sexually assaulted or abused. We serve 12 hospitals across many counties and in many hospital systems in Minnesota. I have sat with hundreds of patients in these exams and assured them that they would not be billed for my services. I should be able to do that without making an exception, but I can't because I have spoken to patients who have mistakenly received a bill for the care they were provided in a medical forensic exam. This is a stress that survivors should never have to face, but it becomes less of a rarity when healthcare facilities grapple with uneven reimbursement from the county payers. Minnesota is one of only six states that still uses a county payer model for reimbursement of medical forensic exam services. My program operates in multiple counties and we see patients that are assaulted in all 87 counties. Um, and we get different levels of reimbursement from each county. This uncertainty presents challenges to program stability and sustainability. Healthcare providers doing this work, whether they operate out of a rural hospital, a level one trauma center, or an urban clinic, should be able to keep their focus on providing exceptional care to every survivor every time. Senate File 1249 will help make this possible. The creation of a state fund will ensure consistency in billing and in payment. The clarification of best practices for medical forensic exams also included in 1249 would transition Minnesota officially into the proactive treatment model we all already adhere to. My program and others across the state manage STI exposure with most patients by offering preventative treatment, which is in line with the recommendations from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The model also reduces the additional stress of added follow-up appointments for survivors. Healthcare providers who do this work need the consistency that Senate File 1249 will bring. It's an important step in ensuring that our focus remains at the bedside, providing trauma-informed, patient-centered care to survivors. I urge you to support this bill, and in doing so, support the sustainability of this important service in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, members, are there any questions? Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Senator Seberger, for carrying the bill, and thank you for your testimony and for your important work. Um, uh, this strikes me as a no-brainer. I would echo your statement that, that this is just insult to injury for a victim to be faced with a, a surprise bill like this. I don't see the fiscal note in our packet, but I'm seeing in another thing here. Oh, Hello. <laughs> I will back away from the mic. Sorry about that, Andra. <laughs> Um, but it sounds like it's uh, to the tune of about $10 million a year. Is that correct, Senator Seberger? It strikes me as high, is my point, and I'm just wondering, does that reflect the volume of sexual assault cases that we have in Minnesota? Senator Seberger? Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Morrison, um, I, I see the fiscal note here. Um, I don't have a, a good answer to your question. I'm happy to look into that and get back to you. Um, Senator Morrison, I just want to, one thing about this bill, it, it was heard, or no, it was referred to judiciary. It was heard in judiciary, and now it was referred to us to hear, but then we're referring it back to judiciary for their budget consideration. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair, and th thank you. That I, I understand it's not a part of our um, omnibus, but I just I think it speaks to uh, perhaps a bigger problem that we have here in Minnesota if it's that high. Uh, thank you again, Senator Seberger, and thank you for your testimony and your work. Senator Atkey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, to piggyback on Senator Morrison's question, I do have a copy of the fiscal note, and I would encourage uh, Senator Seberger to follow up with this, because to me it seems like um, it's not correct. I would have a, uh, 
I kind of wondered because it comes out to, you know, they're talking about 2,500 exams a year, which would be seven a, a day, 365 days a year. And then it's adding two and a half FTEs and such. So, I mean, uh, we all support the program. I just think that they're loading up a little bit on the fiscal note for you and uh, would encourage you to dive into it a little bit because uh, that was my only question on the bills when I started to look at that and highlight things that didn't look good. Thank you. Members, any other questions or comments? No? Um, seeing no other questions or comments, um, I thank you for bringing this forward. It does seem like a, an area that we should have an equitable experience across the state and certainly um, re remove burdens on, on victims for this, this kind of um, testing. And uh, I appreciate your, your work on the bill. Um, and with that, um, members, um, the motion, Senator Morrison moves that Senate file 1249 be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Is that your motion? That is my motion, Madam Chair. Uh, members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, the motion does prevail. The bill, Senate file 1249, um, is recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Next, we will go back to hearing um, Senator Bolden, um, Senate file 2673, we, we will take up next. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and I am grateful to be able to present uh, Senate File 2673. Uh, medical debt is a widespread problem that can be financially devastating for families. Over 750,000 Minnesotans had medical bills and collections in 2018, equal to 17% of Minnesota adults. The impact isn't just financial. Some people delay necessary medical care for fear of taking on more debt. Um, in other cases, hospitals have been known to deny care based on unpaid debt. And I can um, say this is true from personal experience as a nurse and caring for patients. Um, barely a shift goes by that I don't have uh, patients verbalize to me the, the stress and worry about medical debt and medical costs. Um, so in some cases, patients are eligible for financial assistance at the time they receive care, but they aren't aware of it or they aren't able to complete the process to qualify for assistance. Because assistance programs have limited look back periods, by the time people reach out for help with their debt, it's often too late for them to qualify for assistance. Senate, Senate file 2673 addresses this problem by establishing requirements for hospitals to screen patients for eligibility for both health coverage and financial assistance. Um, so in short, what this bill does is that for uninsured patients, the bill requires hospitals to screen them for likely eligibility for charity care, public health care coverage, or premium tax cuts. It assists uh, and, and assists patients to apply for assistance or refer them to a navigator or other support. It also requires hospitals to determine whether a patient is eligible for financial assistance prior to taking certain actions to collect such as referring the debt to a third-party debt collector or pursuing management or litigation. And thirdly, it requires hospitals to certify that they have complied with all the provisions required by the Attorney General. Call Radio Shack. You got questions? Call um, Radio Senator Bolden, if you can hold on. We're having some yeah. challenges in the room with the sound, um, sound being extremely loud. <laughs> Overmodulated. Uh, members, we're going to recess for about 10, 15 minutes so that we can have them uh, work on the sound. Apparently, online they weren't able to hear Senator Bolden either. So, I mean, it, it's it's kind of a, a multifaceted problem. So, um, members, we are in recess.
back to order, uh, and hopefully we will not have more technical difficulties and we can proceed. Uh, we are going to lay over, or I'm going to lay over uh, Senate file 2673 for the time for right now, um, and then we are gonna take up Senate file number 2719 because Senator Muhammad is available to present her bill. Oh, um, and Anna, um, there was a cell phone left in the room we were in, G3. If anyone knows someone who is missing a cell phone, um, there was one left behind. Madam Chair, I'll, uh, I'll move the bill if it would help. Okay. Thank you. Senator Mohammed, uh, feel free to begin your presentation when you're ready. Thank you, Chair Wicklin and members of the committee. This is my first time in this committee, so I'm a little excited. Um, before you is Senate File 2719, a bill that would modify the identification requirements for the insul insulin safety net program. For those who don't know, insulin is a hormone that the human body makes to keep uh, to keep blood glucose levels within a normal range by moving glucose from the bloodstream into the body cells to make energy. And every day, more than 400,000 Minnesotans whose body does not produce this hormone depend, uh, depend on numerous insulin injections each day to live. They are forced to constantly monitor their blood, their blood glucose levels, knowing that an imbalance can have a fatal consequence. So clearly, insulin is one of the most important chemical messengers in our body. It is also one of the most expensive. This bill would identify the identification requirements to qualify for the, for the insulin safety net program. In 2020, the legislature established two programs to provide assistance to individuals who cannot afford the, the cost of insulin. The, urg the urgent need program provides eligible individuals with a 30-day supply and the co-payment cannot exceed $35. The continued need program provides eligible individuals with a 90-day supply of insulin, and the copayment cannot exceed $50. Currently, both programs require individuals to indicate Minnesota residency by presenting a valid Minnesota identification card, driver's license, or permit, or a tribal identification card. Upon the enactment of this bill, individuals would be able to present a TTN as opposed to a social security number. This would allow undocumented individuals to access the insulin safety net program. And with me, I have a testifier. Thank you, Senator Mohammed. Um, yes, we have a testifier online, um, Nicole Smith-Hold. Uh, welcome to the committee, Nicole um, Smith-Hold. And um, please uh, state your name for the record and, and begin your testimony. My name is Nicole Smith-Holt, and I want to say good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. As I said, my name is Nicole Smith-Holt, and I am the ambassador for T1 International, a member of the Minnesota Insulin for All chapter, and I advocate for access to affordable insulin. As many of you know, in 2020, we passed here in Minnesota the Alex Smith Insulin Affordability Act. Unfortunately, when we passed that bill, we were unable to include undocumented immigrants as eligible recipients of the program. At the time, a few of our senators refused to have them included. And as a concession, we agreed, but ultimately knew that we would actively work to amend the bill to have them included. I have not been able to rest easy knowing that since this bill went into effect, we have act actively excluded a large population of people needing the help that this program provides. My wish is that we amend Alex's bill and include undocumented immigrants. I've done a little reading on the topic of rights that are and are not provided to those who are living in Minnesota as undocumented immigrants. And what I read and would like to share with you all is that undocumented immigrants are not just entitled to the basic fundamental human rights, but are also covered by the Constitution of the United States. Without a doubt, the Constitution applies to undocumented immigrants and I'm sorry, on the basis of personhood and jurisdiction in the U.S. Many parts of the Constitution use the term person or persons rather than citizen. It is my understanding that as an undocumented immigrant, you are not eligible for state or federal assistance like medical coverage. 
So many of them are uninsured, making them at high risk for rationing insulin due to affordability of the product. What we need to be concerned about is residency and not citizenship status. Our immigrant community has come to Minnesota for a better life, and we need to honor that. I'm asking that we amend the bill, add coverage for undocumented immigrants, and help make insulin affordable and accessible for all residents of Minnesota. I would also like to add that currently the insulin manufacturers exclude undocumented immigrants from their program. So this leaves them absolutely unprotected against the high prices that are currently charged at the pharmacy and leave them vulnerable to rationing. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony and I appreciate your advocacy and all of the work that you've done in this area. Um, I was, it was an honor to work on the bill a couple years ago with you. Um, Senator Mohammed, any other comments before we go to questions? Um, you know, I think it's clear that this is an important issue for everyone in Minnesota and uh, it's unfortunate that our undocumented community doesn't get access to it and I think it's important that we do this, so thank you. Thank you. Members, questions or comments? Senator Abler. How about a softball? Okay. Um, so, uh, so what do they do now? So a lot of these undocumented folks don't make that much money. How do they get what they need and how does it work currently? That is Chair Wicklin. Chair, um, Senator Mohammed, sorry. Chair, Chair Wicklin, um, Senator um, Abler, that's a good question. I think right now they're, everyone kind of figures out how to get it day by day and it's for most people, maybe like somebody else picks it up for them and um, the conversations I've had with the community members who are struggling with this, it's really hard for some of them to, a lot of them to access it, so. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Mohammed, for carrying this really important bill. This it benefits everyone in the state of Minnesota. For someone who has diabetes that goes unmanaged or inadequately managed, that creates long-term health challenges and emergency room visits that cost everyone. So this is a really common sense, in the big picture, low-cost way to help Minnesotans manage their diabetes. Thank you. Senator Atkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, has, has a fiscal note been ordered on this? I would imagine there's cost because of the, the part that we state would be covering. Um, Senator Atkey, we have requested a fiscal note and we, yeah, we aren't sure if there will be a cost associated, but, but yes, one has been requested and we will be laying the bill over today. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. That was my next question, so that it'll just lay over and wait till we get that. So, yeah. thank you. Any other questions or comments, members? Uh, well, thank you very much, Senator Mohammed, for bringing this bill forward. It was something, you know, when I worked on the original um, Alex Smith Insulin Affordability Act, um, it was. Uh, such an honor to work with um, with Ms. Smithhold and trying to do something that would benefit um, all Minnesotans. And there are, are many who have a need for insulin, um, and it shouldn't be um, too hard for them to get. I mean, it shouldn't be at all hard for them to be able to afford their insulin. Uh, but given our our situation, um, being able to make an emergency access program and a affordability program available to, you know, all who who need access to that um, is really the right thing to do. And I'm really glad that we're able to kind of correct what what I had hoped we'd been able to put in place in the first place. Um, so uh, I really appreciate your, your bringing this forward. Thank you. And with that, we will lay this lay Senate file 2719 over. Thank you. Uh, next, we will take back, we will take up Senate file 2673, uh, Senator Bolden, we were, um, you were discussing the bill, uh, but um, you do have a, an author's amendment. Would you like to have us move the author's amendment? 
Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I would move the A2, I believe. Yes, the A2 amendment. Um, Senator Bolden moves the A2 amendment. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The amendment is adopted. Well, Senator Bolden, if you wish to start, um, start where you were or start at the beginning, <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I, I'm not sure either. Um, I'm happy to start at the beginning, or I'm, I'm not sure where where to start. You know when where. You, when you start where you, at the beginning, um, it was difficult with the sound um, to concentrate on on your presentation. So, please go ahead. Very good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, members, medical debt is a widespread problem that can be financially devastating for families. Over 750,000 Minnesotans had medical bills in collections in 2018. This is equal to 17% of Minnesota adults. And this impact isn't just financial. Some people delay necessary medical care for fear of taking on more debt. In other cases, hospitals have been known to deny care based on unpaid debt. And I can tell you, um, as a practicing nurse, I hear this almost during every shift from my patients, the, the worry and the concern about uh, medical debt and the cost of medical care. It is real for many, many patients. In some cases, in some cases, patients are eligible for financial assistance at the time they receive care, but they aren't aware of it or aren't able to complete the process to qualify for assistance. Because assistance programs have a limited look back period, by the time people reach out for help with that debt, it's often too late for them to qualify for assistance. Senate file 2673 addresses this problem by establishing requirements for hospitals to screen patients for eligibility for health coverage or financial assistance. Um, so in basic, it does three things. One, for uninsured patients, the bill requires hospitals to screen for likely eligibility for charity care public health care coverage or premium tax credits and assist patients with applications for assistance or refer them to a navigator or other support. It requires hospitals to determine whether a patient is eligible for financial assistance prior to taking certain actions to collect debt, such as referring debt to a third party debt collector, pursuing wage garnishments or litigation. And lastly, it requires hospital, hospitals to certify that they have complied with all the provisions required by the attorney general agreement related to debt collection prior to referring a patient account for collections. Um, and I just want to know the stakeholders that um, were consulted and engaged in this bill development, including the Minnesota Hospital Association, Navigator Coalition, Lutheran Social Service Financial Counseling, and the United Community Action Partnership. And also just to thank the attorney general's office, Minshore, DHF, GHS uh, for their feedback on the bill, as well as uh, Mr. Monahan and Senate Council. Uh, and I believe we have a few testifiers as well, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Bolden. Yes, we we do have testifiers. Um, I believe on online we have Jonathan Marshand. Is that correct? And if you can please um, state your name for the record and begin your testimony. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, can you hear okay? Yes, we can. All right. Yes, can. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you again. Uh, my name is Jonathan Marchand. I'm a community services manager with United Community Action Partnership, as you can tell, um, based in Wilmer, Minnesota. Uh, we cover a nine county area of West Central Minnesota into kind of Southern. Um, community Action provides uh, a number of different uh, resources, programs, and supports and services for low-income individuals and families, including uh, Head Start, fuel assistance, um, uh, volunteer income tax assistance, as well as Minshore Navigator services. And as I mentioned earlier, our, uh, our community that we serve are low-income families and, and individuals. Um, ensuring that people are made aware of what assistance they qualify for and uh, are able to get matched with that assistance uh, with that application process um, would very much help to reduce the likelihood of incurring preventable medical debt for all of the families and individuals that we work with. Um, how we function as a Minsure Navigator Agency, we have been able to partner with some of our local healthcare centers um, as far as how to work cooperatively with uh, uh, 
folks who come in and it turns out that they discover there's no insurance in place. So this is a process that is, is not, um, it, it's not inventing the wheel from scratch. Uh, I, well, this can happen uh, with, with little work, I would imagine that that would go above and beyond what some agencies are already doing cooperatively with other agencies. Um, we are also working with some of our healthcare centers to plan how to work during the MA Medicaid unwinding, um, which is another uh, huge ordeal facing our consumers. So this history of working cooperatively together is, is not a new one for sure. Um, we have all witnessed firsthand uh, how tight budgets and low incomes affect the households that we work with. Um, and it is essential that we strive to avoid and prevent the accumulation of medical debt any way we can. Um, for all of the consumers we work with, we are living at paycheck to paycheck or less, and things can change in an instant. Um, we, uh, our son was involved in a car accident yesterday. Everyone's okay. Um, but this uh, car accident involved totaling of one of our vehicles and a ambulance ride to the emergency room, um, which meant that we are down a vehicle and we have an out-of-pocket maximum that has been reached here in the first quarter of the year. And um, as Murphy's Law would have it, our furnace went out this morning. So that's a $4,500 repair bill. This is what our families face. We have a position where we can probably get through many of our families cannot. And the situations like this, that can lead to the incurring of huge medical debts. And this is precisely what we seek to try to avoid. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, now we will move to uh, testifiers in the room. First, I have Anna Odegaard and Nadine Gall. Um, please state your name for the record and begin. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Anna Odegaard. I'm the director of the Minnesota Asset Building Coalition, which is a statewide coalition of 135 nonprofit organizations uh, serving low-income communities. You heard Senator Bolden share that over 750,000 Minnesotans have unpaid medical debt. Uh, I want to emphasize that that is a huge number, but only captures part of the problem. It doesn't capture medical debt that is being paid over time to the provider on a payment plan that might cause ongoing financial hardship for families. It doesn't consider loans from a bank or other lender or from family or friends um, that has taken on to pay medical debt. And worst of all, it doesn't count credit card debt that is taken on to pay medical bills. The Kaiser Family Foundation found that when they included these, which they call medical debt disguised as another kind of debt, over 40% of American adults have medical debt. This statistic was not news to the Minnesota Asset Building Coalition members, my coalition members, because we work with families every day who are struggling with this hardship, trying to decide which bills to pay and which to skip this month and still put food on the table. You know the goal of this bill, to reduce medical debt taken on unnecessarily. Um, I would urge you to take a look at the article from the Rochester Post Bulletin included in your packets um, with the catchy but ultimately discouraging headline, Charity Care? They found it on TikTok. People who have been lucky enough not to struggle with unaffordable medical bills may not fully understand the barriers people face in the midst of a health crisis accessing the assistance they need and that they're eligible for, or even knowing what's available. We can't rely on TikTok to help Minnesotans understand their options. I'm very grateful to Senator Bolden and Chair Wickland for taking the lead on this important work. Thank you. Um, next we have Nadine Gall. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Hello, Chair Wickland. My name is Nadine Gall, and I'm a certified financial counselor with Lutheran Social Service of Minnesota. I'm here in support of Senate File 2673, aimed to screen patients for public health care coverage and other financial assistance before proceeding with payment plans, debt collection, denial of care, or credit product. In my work, I see how medical bills affect our clients' finances on a regular basis. Money that could be used for other priority bills or to meet the family's basic needs is diverted to medical bills in order to maintain medical care and avoid other long-term consequences of unpaid medical debt. 
Assisting eligible patients with the enrollment of public health care programs or discounted care helps families avoid the financial stress of medical debt that would have been covered by other programs or assistance. My job includes working with people directly. A common barrier that I hear is filling out and managing paperwork. As applications for medical assistance programs and charity care are not quick and may require additional documentation. There are barriers with language, reading and writing, or overall capacity to manage documents. In stressful times, especially with medical needs, extra support makes it possible to complete the screening process. Medical assistance programs can backdate bills up to three months, so doing this in a timely manner is important. For example, I had a college student with an $1,100 bill <clears throat> excuse me, that would have been covered by her hospital's financial assistance program, including an affordable repayment plan by the client. But the deadline to apply had passed, and as a result, the bill went to collections and the hospital did not receive any payment. It's really hard to ask for help. Directly offering assistance as part of the process reduces the stigma, feelings of shame, that may stop someone from accessing available resources. Shame affects people of all income levels, and I regularly hear relief in people's voices when they tell me, thank you for providing options without judgment. Normalizing the use of assistance programs and informing clients they qualify for them can increase access to healthcare and reduce the burden of medical debt. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Um, next, we have a um, Jason Plegenkuhl. And Danny Ackert. Okay. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is Jason Plegenkuhl. I'm an assistant attorney general and I'm manager of the Consumer Wage and Antitrust Division of the Attorney General's Office. Attorney General Ellison regrets that he couldn't be with you today but he asked me to testify in his stead in order to voice his strong support for Senate File 2673, which builds on the protections provided by the agreement the Attorney General's Office holds with all nonprofit hospitals in Minnesota, which is known as the Hospital Agreement. The Hospital Agreement was first, first reached in 2005 following a compliance review conducted by our office that revealed a hospital was engaged in numerous concerning debt collection, billing, and charity care practices. Among other things, the agreement requires hospitals in Minnesota to abide by their charitable missions and standards of conduct when engaging in billing, debt collection, and litigation to collect debt, which includes verifying proper billing has occurred and a patient actually owes the medical debt before engaging in collection activity, filing a lawsuit or garnishing wages, offering reasonable payment plans to patients that have an inability to pay, informing patients of their charity care policy and giving them a reasonable opportunity to apply for it, not reporting patients to credit reporting agencies for failing to pay a medical bill, and not charging uninsured patients more than they charge their most favored insurer for medically necessary treatment. Since 2005, the hospital agreement has continued to be renewed and currently covers all 128 nonprofit hospitals in Minnesota, as well as one for-profit hospital system. Not only does Senate File 2673 codify the verification requirements of the hospital agreement in law, it adds to the protections provided by the hospital agreement in important ways. First, it requires hospitals to conspicuously post notice about the availability of charity care and to proactively screen patients for eligibility for charity care um, uh, with a screening process to indicate if they're eligible. It also prohibits hospitals from imposing burdensome procedures on patients uh, when they're applying for charity care. And only after a patient is determined to be ineligible for charity care can the hospital then establish another repayment plan option with the patient. Second, the bill also uh, requires that in order to refer a patient's medical debt to a third party debt collector or file a debt collection lawsuit, the hospital first has to complete an affidavit attesting that it has completed all the verification requirements that are now gonna be codified and are in the hospital agreement, um, and that it has screened the patient for charity care eligibility. Um, finally, the bill also ensures uninsured patients will only be charged the lowest amount the hospital would be reimbursed for the service or treatment from a private third-party payer. 
Affordable health care is essential for Minnesotans to be able to afford their lives and live with dignity and respect. The Attorney General's Office wholeheartedly welcomes these added patient protections that will ensure hospitals take a proactive approach consistent with their charitable missions to ensure that patients who are eligible for charity care are given a fair opportunity to apply for it and receive it. And for these reasons, Attorney General Ellison strongly supports Senate File 2673 and urges the committee to support its passage. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Danny Ackert. I serve as the Director of State Government Relations for the Minnesota Hospital Association. I want to, uh, this, I'm, I'm speaking to the bill as amended. The amendment was posted after the bill actually began uh, uh, being presented by the author. We haven't had much time to review this amendment. Um, I will note that this bill in its form last year was passed uh, it, by the House. We worked with the advocates and the bill author in the House on this. That bill, this version, is, are, is far different. It includes elements of the bill that we worked on last year now that we uh, we worked and came to agreement on, including the issues surrounding prior to discharge. Um, as other testifiers have presented today, the application process here, and this involves a lot of paperwork, a lot of time, potential more meetings, scheduling things with navigators. Uh, we, we feel like that could be co a constraint based on, a, on the fact that discharging patients is hard, and, and that might be counterintuitive. If a patient is just sitting there, how come they can't get a meeting? We don't want this to limit the time it takes to get someone discharged, given the fact that our members are doing, in our understanding, as much as possible to screen every patient and make sure that patients are aware of all options for them. We are not here, and I am not here to diminish any of the instances or hardships that this ha or the problem is we're addressing today has concerned our members. We want this bill to work as best as possible. That's why we hope to continue engaging with the author, authors, both the House and the Senate, with the advocates. Um, we have not been brought in any conversation with the Attorney General's office. The codifying the AG's uh, agreement is a new element um, uh, that we have not been told isn't working currently as it's been applied. So we have some concerns, but we are more concerned about the 1.5 million Minnesotans on medical assistance who are about to be put through a transition from the public health emergency. So we are committed to making sure that those individuals and that all individuals have the coverage that's available to them and wanna make sure that the complicated nature of that situation can best be reflected and served by what we're required to do and by what our, your constituents and what Minnesotans and other elements that are involved in this process expect as well. So we want, we're gonna continue working. We haven't really had much time to look at this amendment. It's brand new today. So with that, I hope to continue these conversations. If there's any questions, please let us know. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And last I have Judy Cook. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Judy Cook, uh, here today representing the Great Lakes Credit and Collections Association. I apologize to the bill author that we have not had an opportunity to talk to her. I'm only commenting today because of the addition of the A2 amendment. We, um, frankly, the association had no position on the bill other than we were working with um, Ms. Odegaard on some clarifying language, which we were feeling pretty good about reaching um, an understanding on that, uh, as well as the hospital association. Um, the Minnesota uh, collection agencies are very careful to follow the attorney general's agreement, as do our hospital clients. We are unaware of any issues. Again, I need to, I just want to go on record that I need to review this um, with our client because there's a whole lot more in here than there was to the underlying bill and perhaps we'll have an opportunity to discuss that um, at, at another stop such as Commerce Committee which oversees you know, the collection agency um, world. So uh, I just wanted to make a quick comment and thank you. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. Um, members, do you have questions? Um, questions, Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Bolden, for bringing this bill forward. Um, I, I'm. This is really important, and it, being hospitalized is a huge opportunity for people who don't have access to healthcare to get enrolled. Um, in my experience, and I only have professional experience in one hospital in Minnesota, that this happens. Um, and so 
I think it's important that it happens in all hospitals. I just want to, the, um, the uh, comment about delaying discharge got my attention. I just want to make sure that this amendment wouldn't delay discharge given, and it looks like it takes effect November. Um, I'm just very uh, aware of what's happening in our hospitals right now, and I'm wondering, I don't know who could answer that question for me. I don't know if you can, Senator Bolden, or if maybe one of the testifiers could. Um, Senator Bolden? Madam Chair, um, I will start, yes, and appreciate uh, the question, and um, I am not looking to delay discharge for any patients. Certainly recognize that issue in my professional work as well, and so, um, I guess I would perhaps defer to, to counsel to give an opinion on that, and I'm happy to uh, adjust language um, if necessary, because that's not the intention. Senate counsel, I don't know if Mr. Monahan, would you have any uh, Madam Chair, Senator uh, Bolden, um, we could amend it now, orally, if that's the desire of the author or the committee, or um, as the representative from the hospital said, perhaps um, discussions could continue and it could be amended at a later time. Uh, and uh, Senator Bolden, this bill uh, we will be sending on to judiciary, and then I'm, I'm not sure if there's other stops, but it will be referred from here to do judiciary. Madam Chair. Um, Senator Bolden. Um, yeah, I'm happy to um, continue conversations uh, with both the Minnesota Hospital Association and um, the other testifier as well. I recognize that, um, that there wasn't a, that, that the amendment was posted, um, you know, just today. And so there, there has been a lot of work happening with this bill. And so I'm very open to continuing those conversations. Thank you. Uh, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I wonder if the Jason from the Attorney General's office would come down. I have a, a series of questions. Um, there'll be softballs because I'm going to uh, get to the root of why I'm I'm doing it. In the interest of time, Madam Chair, I know this has got the next stop is judiciary, but it's pretty important that I that I ask these questions and I and I get clarification as far as what's going on. First of all. Senator Bolden, I almost said the other body, you're, what you were and you over there, but Senator Bolden, thank you for bringing this bill forward. It's absolutely deeply needed. Um, as somebody who uh, uh, used to work in, in the industry that our Lutheran Social Services person works in, uh, I understand um, just how important this is. And I remember um, a former attorney general saying 50% of all um, bankruptcies in the state of Minnesota were because of medical debt, right? Um, having some lived experience in it as well. So Jason, uh, Mr. I didn't get your last name, Jason. So if I, is it okay if I, Plague Mr. Cool. Jason or Jason, uh, assistant, assistant attorney general, that's what a cool, that's kind of, um, this is in, in your attorney opinion, um, medical bills from a hospital are unsecured debt, correct? Uh, That's correct. Thank you. So I'm just seeing if we're consistent with the Fair Debt Collections and Practices Act. And they're also known as non-contractual debt, correct? Mr. Plague Plag and Cool? Um, I believe so. Thank you. I mean, a contractual debt is if I signed a piece of paper with a credit card company like CARE, I'm not going to name some of the medical debt um, credit card companies that are out there that charge just absolutely um, uh, un unconscionable rates on people that are having a non-contractual, unsecured uh, thing happened to them, right? So I guess the next question is then, um, do these hospitals sell their debt to a third-party billing company? Do you know? Mr. Plagenkuhl? Uh, we can get back to you on that. I don't know. I don't, I think they ref typically refer them out to debt collection agencies for collection. They don't sell them to debt buyers, but um, I don't know that's absolutely the case. Okay, I, I would like Senator some. Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like some clarification because I know that does happen, and that there's been some um, inconsistencies with how debt collection is handled. When you buy something, you're buying at a at a less reduced cost, and you're, and then you're charging, you're charging more, or you're charging that plus you're charging some incidental fees, and then the other thing that compiles up is, you know, when you say. 
can, you have to prove that that was the, the debt, the original debt, right? And a lot of people don't understand, especially their, their rights pursuant to the Fair Debt Collections and Practices Act. And when you get into Section 805, is what Lutheran Social Services then pulls into being, that you're giving somebody the ability to go in and, and work on your behalf. It's hard to because still the potential or the, the prevailing attitude of those debt collectors are not very nice. And, and so, and I'm going to say that, and I'll probably get in trouble. I'm not going to get in trouble because it's a true statement. I mean, I can go do that. But third party buying on any debt, right, is really harsh, and that's not okay when it comes to, I'm glad you validated and confirmed that it's unsecured and that it is a non-contractual debt, right, it's a medical debt. And so, Madam Chair, I guess the point, thank you for that uh, assistant, um, and, 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 and it, would, it would be nice if, if you had any data that, that backed that up. I mean, I have some old data, I don't have any new data that backed up about third party buying of any debt. Um, there's a couple of attorney generals, Swanson and um, uh, the one before Swanson was the, uh, did, did a lot of work on that. Mike Hatch did, did a lot of work on that stuff. Um, it's just not okay. So Madam, Madam Chair, I, if we're gonna, are we gonna move this to judiciary? And, and I'm glad to hear everybody, including you know the MHA and then uh, uh, Ms. Cook's organizations saying that they're gonna be working with um, uh, Senator Bolden on this. Thank you, um, mm -hmm. Mr. Um, Attorney General. Um, Senator Bolden, if there's anything I could do to help support you in this, this is something that it's, it's too important not to dismiss. And uh, I have a very keen interest in this. And, and I'd like to see you get some, you know, get. I hope you get some, some peace in the valley on this one, right? Without giving up the fact that people should have when you're looking at medical bills, when you're looking at medical rights, that people should have what's best interest of the person that is receiving it, right? Um, which then I, I would also think, Madam Chair, as long as you're going down that road, why are we still allowing like credit card? Also, now when you put your medical bill on a credit card, that becomes contractual. Non-contractual, contra contractual. Now you're in trouble, right? Because then that just get absolutely gets hit against you when you're looking at your FICO score. The other one that gets hit against you too is that all of a sudden these collection agencies start saying that they're, they're reporting to the, to the credit card uh, um, companies that, that, that this is, and, and I mean to the experience of the world, and all of a sudden that hits you wrong. And I just don't, I don't like that practice, and I just want to know, uh, this is going to judiciary, and then do you, is it coming back to you, or how is this going, do you know? I don't know if we have the full path yet. Yeah. So we'll have to, we would have to talk, Senator Bolin will have to talk with. All right, that's fine. I just wanted to get make sure I support this bill absolutely huge, and, and, uh, and I'm glad to see you bringing this up. So thank you, Senator Bolin. Thank you. Senator Edke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, to my seatmate to my left, uh, I have to uh, disagree. I think this is a really bad bill. Um, I, I saw it last year. It's not needed. Um, I thoroughly believe that our hospitals do everything within their power already. They have to collect money, get paid to keep their doors open. They are going to do everything they can to help these patients access money to be able to pay these uh, debts. Um, uh, to me, this is just another assault on our uh, medical providers, and in this case, uh, hospitals. Um, and I, I'll start off with a question. Going from the bill that we had to the amendment that we now have before us, why did we add statute or references to statute 8.31 to this bill? That happens to be the uh, Attorney General statute. Senator Bolden, or do you have a testifier you'd like to? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Aki, could you point to a line in the bill for me to refer to? Also, I'll um, just add it was in, you know, through conversations with, with advocates and the Attorney General's office um, in order to just be clear about what we're looking to do. Senator Aki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, um, it's in there twice on line 3.28 and then on 5.30. So two different pages, three and five. Uh, thank you, Senator Aki, and, and thank 
Chair Wickland. Senator Bolden, um, Assistant Attorney, Attorney General, um, Mr. Plagenpool has come up to the table. Would you like him to address the question? Certainly, thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Plagenpool. Madam Chair, Senator, I, be I believe the question is why was 8.31 referenced in the amendment? Is that correct? Madam Senator Chair, Rocky. yes, that is correct. Uh, I'm, when I looked at the original bill that we had before us and that had no references to 8.31, and now with the amendment that was just given to us, it's in there twice. Um, and just wondering why this special emphasis on that. Mr. Plagenkuhl. Madam Chair, Senator, uh, 8.31 is the Attorney General's enforcement statute, and so that clarifies that the Attorney General would have enforcement authority if there are violations of these provisions. The Attorney General could investigate and enforce them to make sure the law is being complied with. Senator Aki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, would not the Attorney General's office already have that authority? If this is in statute and somebody violates statute, that's where we would go as a state is to the Attorney General's office, correct? Mr. Plagenkuhl. So, uh, Madam Chair, Senator, the um, Section 8.31 provides the Attorney General a broad enforcement authority, and this is this language re really clarifies and make, makes it crystal clear that we can enforce the statute. And in that in that sense, we're not going to get into arguments or litigation over whether or not we have authority. This is just meant to to clarify: yes, we do, and we can get to the matter of enforcement rather than having to have that argument. Senator Atkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and as long as we have our testifier at the table, it was brought up uh, previously talking about whether the hospital bill is contracted or not. When we go into the hospital um, for a procedure, whatever, um, we sign a whole bunch of papers that says we are responsible for the bill. They check our insurance information, make sure that they have that all on file. Um, that's all done as we enter. Would not that be a contract that says I am liable for that payment? Mr. Plagenkuhl. Madam Chair, Senator, it really depends on what the document is they're signing. Usually that's, I think you might be thinking about informed consent documents or other, other documents. So, um, you know, I think, uh, whether or not there's it's contractual debt, um, I think the answer is no. Senator Atkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and with after, I'll just go on to a few the, the comments that you know some has already been touched on. Um, if we're doing this at discharge, the the delay in discharge is extremely concerning, um, but that's already been brought up um, for for many different reasons. And I will, uh, I've used this term before, um, people don't like it, but at some point there's personal responsibility. Um, we go in and incur these debts. Um, yeah, healthcare isn't something that we always get to pick when we have these things, so they're, they're uh, something we can't prepare for. But even so, when we're done, um, we should be responsible for seeking out forms of payment, forms of help, whatever it might be. It isn't just to get the health care and run. And that, to me, this just puts 100% of the burden on the provider, which we know has got a vested interest in. Um, you know, we, we want these providers to, to be around and stick with us. Um, we all need health care, and we need it going forward. And we need to help them figure out how they're going to uh, collect their money rather than just threaten them with a penalty every time something slips through the cracks. And uh, that's why I was not in favor of this bill last year. And uh, um, that hasn't changed. And this uh, amendment for me has actually made it worse. So I hope that uh, we can continue these conversations going forward and get something that's more workable. We want to make the job easier on our providers because they don't have the personnel to keep running after these bad bills either um, and do what we can to assist them in any way possible to get payments for their 
the, the services they provided. Um, and to, this is just, uh, yeah, I, like I said before, I, I see it as an assault on our hospitals, and I hope we can do better. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Abler. Well, thanks, Madam Chair, and I'm somewhere between the last two senators who spoke. Um, I, uh, you know, favor patient protections, but they have to be reasonable. And I, Senator Bolden, as you're working on this, um, there wasn't really enough testimony, and I'm not looking for more right now, but about what really isn't working right. Uh, and I've spent enough time since the committee started reading the amendment and no time before that, so I'm not deeply versed in this, but reading the amendment, it's like we never had this, any kind of program whatsoever before. And I know that uh, there's probably imperfections and challenges in the system that are ranging from minor to probably only medium. Uh, I don't think there's any extreme examples, uh, except the one where um, uh, Health Partners uses the uh, power of the state uh, management budget for 15 bucks to collect it, its debt, which I don't think that's fair. Um, and uh, some other ambulance and companies do that. But I think that's a problem we should get after. I had a bill on that. Um, but I, um, as you look after this, I would suggest that you make, the, you make the, the tool you're using as focused as possible to be sure you don't make it harder um, on the, the system. And you've heard some of the concerns anyway. And I, um, just as you read, um, like on line 2.25, it says the hospital may not impose application procedures for charity care that place an unreasonable burden on individual patients taking into account their capacity. Um, I mean, I don't even know what that means. That, that is an undefined term, you know, that are an unreasonable burden. Um, so you just have to define some of these terms so that, you, that, that the hospitals aren't wondering and that they, people can say, well, I just don't feel like filling it out and that's an unreasonable burden and then they can't get paid. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in line 3.9, um, that they can't deny health services to anybody. Um, and I can understand you might, you might want to deny services. You can haggle about what, when you have to stop serving somebody. But it doesn't even matter if they're necessary services. Uh, line 3.9, whether the services are deemed necessary. Like, why would we even be required to give unnecessary services? That doesn't make any sense to me. And I circled on my own the power of the Attorney General, uh, which is not a small bit of power. Do you need that much power? Are they really not complying? We have to put the power of the full force. I think the, I think the Attorney General has other things they may do. Um, on line 4.20, um, so they're filling out these forms, um, and they have to consider that in line 4.20, that the patient may consider that she's already answered the complaint by writing to the hospital, um, which is, as vague as it can be, and it's, un, it's an unworkable sentence. Like, I, oh, I thought I did it. Like, okay. Um, I mean, it's just interesting. And then uh, on line 4.2 to Senator Hoffman, uh, that the patient is so elderly as to potentially render the patient unable to answer that. Like, what kind of a term is that? Um, they're just, the people call me that sometimes, but um, I'm on my way. But I just, you want it to be tight. You want it to be focused. Um, and then uh, on line 5.15, failure to comply with these subdivisions, uh, a fine assessed by the Commissioner of Health. I don't know that it clarifies how big the fine is unless it's referencing some other chart of fines. And then finally, I don't know why, maybe this is the existing law, but that on line 5.22, 125,000 is when you get the benefit of usual and customary for not insured. Um, I don't know if that's existing or not, but that seems like it's an arbitrary number. And so, Senator Bolden, I'm happy to help you with this. I've, you know, just make sure you're addressing the problems that exist. And you don't want to require a great deal of new training at the hospital on what they're already doing and, and turn every system on its head, as you know. And I'm sure you're not in, intending that, but I, I'm all in to solve the problem that's there once we figure out what that is. Thank you, Madam Chair. S Senator Bolden, did you wish to comment or? Um, I, yes, I have a, a couple of comments just in, in response to the, the comments we've heard. So, um, I, I appreciate the discussion. I do. Um, and, uh, as I have said, um, I'm committed to continuing to have conversations with, with stakeholders and with, um, with anyone who would like to, uh, collaborate to make this, 
uh, more workable and and a, and a better policy um, because it is needed. And um, just respectfully to Senator Utke around your comments that it isn't needed. Um, respectfully, I would disagree. I would encourage you to read the article from the Post Bulletin. Um, you know, right now, not all hospitals are providing this information to patients. And, um, you know, I want to make things easier for patients. As was referenced, the majority of bankruptcies in this country are related to medical debt. This is a weight around the neck of many, many patients and families across the country, across our state. Um, and it impacts every corner of their lives in many cases. And so, um, you know, what we're asking hospitals to do, and some hospitals are already doing this, which is great. They can continue, um, but not all of them are. And so we want to kind of raise that bar so that all of them are to just provide information to patients, provide information on if they are, you know, eligible to have coverage or if they are eligible for charity care. And, you know, if patients are not knowing that they are eligible for uh, coverage, that is going to help the, the hospitals get receive payment when, you know, they may not have at all before. And so um, really we're just, um, you know, wanting to get information to patients uh, so they can continue to get the care that they need and not be saddled with outrageous medical debt. And so um, again, I'll just say I'm, I'm committed to continuing um, to work on this policy and, and to get it right to be able to help patients. Thank you. Uh, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you for having this conversation, Madam Chair. The In, in the uh, in the amendment, I should have, uh, and thank you for pointing that out, Senator Abler. At 4.22, that's the, the two sentences there. It's very, very ableistic language, and to say a sick, disabled, infirm, or so elderly, I, I would, can we kind of change that up? I mean, if you wanted to, if the purpose of this part that they're under, under unable to answer the complaint or that they're gonna be garnishment proof, right? Then there's a there's a section in law that says, it, it highlights who's garnishment proof, right? Social security benefits, supplemental security income, public assistance, that kind of stuff. Um, but if, if it's in here, maybe, you know, at your next stop, if you could have the folks who helped write this for you kind of reword that, you know, with people first language in there, I'd, I'd appreciate that, so. Um, that's all I got to add to that. So thank you for pointing that out. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Monahan, did you have a? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Hoffman, I just wanted um, to mention that the, the language in these clauses, two through seven, are uh, virtually verbatim out of the existing agreement between the Attorney General and the hospitals. Um, this. Uh, the request was to recreate that language and statute, and so that is what Senator uh, Bolden did. Thank okay. Madam Hoffman. Chair, Mr. Monahan, thank you for that clarification. Then perhaps I could ask the Attorney General, could you please go back <laughs> and, and look at your language and your wording? Um, I would appreciate that, uh, just that case of it. And in the case, you could you could still make those changes in here. Um, uh, uh, Senator Bolden, that would uh, I would appreciate that if you did that. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Senator Abler. Well, thank you, and I appreciate the discussion too. Uh, and Senator Hoffman, I remind you that this now, Senator Bolden, you bring a bill forward. It's you're the author, but it belongs to all of us, and so mm -hmm. it doesn't belong to the Attorney General and Senator Hoffman. Uh, I, you might want to suggest language that they would find reasonable that you would write. Anyway, so, and just the last thing, and I'm sorry I have to leave to go to my day job. Um, but so, um, this, this, this discussion about medical bankruptcies is not a new one. And the question that this bill, before we even use that statement, we need to know how many medical bankruptcies are because people didn't know they could sign up for these various programs, and are there some hospitals better than others and not, and what programs work well at hospitals that we could model and put into here that actually work. So that's why it's, it's meant to be positive to the discussion. Uh, just to remind Madam Chair and the, the people listening is that I think given the status of some people who are fully insured when they're $40,000 from their first dollar coverage, that alone might be enough to sink some people. And we had a, a testifier yesterday on that that was using her inhaler. Um, and so I queried about that, is that a generic? And somebody remarked, well, maybe their insurance changed on the first of the year, and they have a much higher 
situation. So we don't know, we, we just want to be sure we fix the right problems. Is it generics? Is it the health plan? Is it something else? And so uh, Senator Bolden, I, I, I'm after what you want to try to fix, and I'm happy to be a part of that. And thank you, Madam Chair. Um, members, I think, are seeing no other questions or comments. Um, as, as I stated, um, this bill will be referred to the Judiciary Committee for more discussion, and it sounds like Senator Bolden is open to having future discussions with um, all of those affected. Um, and so, Senator Bolden, um, your motion, uh, it would be that Senate File 2673, as amended, be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Is that your motion? Yes, Madam Chair, so moved. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those, any opposed? No. The motion does prevail. Senate File 2673, as amended, um, is passed and referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Thank you, members. Now, Senator Bolden, you have uh, Senate File 2606. Early Childhood Apprentice Program Establishment. And please go yes. ahead and present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're gonna switch gears a little bit here. So yes. members, we, <laughs> we uh, have heard much discussion um, of the crisis of our state is, that our state is facing in terms of the childcare sector. Slots are often not available. The price for families is very often too high. And across the board, we are paying early childhood educators a dismal compensation rate, lower than even that of dog walkers in many cases. Higher education institutions are reporting having issues recruiting and retaining candidates for their early childhood programs. Those candidates that do pursue early childhood education face difficulties funding their education, often while also working and finding apprenticeship opportunities because there frankly aren't many places that can offer a program that's financially viable when most places are struggling just to keep their doors open. We know that those first five years of a child's life are absolutely vital to shaping who they will become. It's important for the adults caring for our little ones to be well-trained, qualified individuals with the right tools to help our little ones thrive. This sector has struggled for too long, and we have the opportunity now to help to recruit more folks into this profession and professionalize and better compensate the workforce behind the workforce. We've heard the Great Start bill in this committee, and we'll continue to discuss the governor's recommendations and other bills to help uplift our community of early childhood educators. Uh, this bill, Senate File 2606, is an important piece of that discussion. Um, Anne McCulley from Transforming Minnesota's Early Childhood Workforce is here today to explain how this bill fits into the bigger picture. Um, but first, Madam Chair, I do have an author's amendment. Yes, uh, thank you, Senator Bolden. Um, Senator Bolden has the A5 author's amendment. Uh, members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Um, the amendment is adopted. Sorry. So, uh, Senator Bolden, do you have more to say about the uh, bill, or do you want to go to your testifier? We can move to uh, testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Uh, Ms. McCulley, please introduce yourself and um, begin your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Ann McCulley, and I am the co-chair of Transforming Minnesota's Early Childhood Workforce Team. We were formed in 2016 to build on the recommendations of the National Institute of Medicine's Transforming the Workforce for Children Birth Through Age 8 report. Our goal is to ensure that Minnesota's early educators are qualified, diverse, supported, and equitably compensated, regardless of setting. In 2018, we, we created a long-term plan, much of which was incorporated into the recently released Great Start for All Minnesota's Children Task Force Report. And there is a graphic in your packets uh, that attempts to illustrate all the things, it looks like a mountain, uh, we've been trying to do both prior to now and into the future to really wrap together a number of initiatives and projects that will really get at this issue, particularly of compensation in our field. Uh, this bill, Senate File 2606, complements and supports the compensation and workforce proposals included in both the Great Start Act of 2023, which you heard earlier this week, as well as the workforce package that is in the upcoming governor's bill. 
In this bill, we add three additional initiatives. The first is an apprentice, an, a registered apprenticeship program. It will build on work currently underway to pilot a child care apprenticeship in Minnesota using a model developed by the National Teach Center. This model is being further refined to fit Minnesota's standards in consultation from the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry and the Department of Human Services. And the, the pilot will launch in June. Apprenticeships provide a unique opportunity to support skill development in the field of early childhood education. Utilizing the structure of an apprenticeship, a participant will be able to gain employment and attend institutions of higher education working toward an industry-recognized credential or degree. Combining employment, on-the-job training, college coursework, and individualized mentoring, an apprenticeship can be a chance to build a more stable early childhood workforce. The second element of the bill is to target funds within the existing workforce development scholarships, specifically for early childhood education. This program provides scholarships to students enrolled in high demand educational programs, leading to employment in six industries, advanced manufacturing, agriculture, healthcare services, information technology, transportation, and early childhood education. While early childhood is already in allowable use, We've seen the uptake on these scholarships hover between only three and 6% of the overall scholarships awarded. The reason for the lower percentage of students accessing these scholarships can vary from campus to campus, but it is time to look at carving out a set amount of money specifically for early childhood education students to help alleviate the dramatic shortfall right now in childcare. The final proposal is to offer grants to our higher education institutions to embed the knowledge and competency framework now used across the early care and education system into their coursework. The knowledge and competency framework is a framework that helps um, all folks working in early childhood understand what they should be able to know and do. And we wanna use it to better align our systems and prepare our students to be successful once they enter the field. The early care and education workforce serves children, families, businesses, and our entire economy. We hope you'll support these strategies as part of the overall goal to ensure that we have an early childhood workforce that is supported to succeed. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Members, questions? Senator Atkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. And actually, this question is for you. Um, how does this fit into the big bill that you presented earlier this week, which was, I think, to the tune of about $6 billion? <laughs> Is this part of that? Um, Senator Utke, there are components of this bill that are contained in that bill that I presented um, the other day. I think maybe there's some changes, or you know, the component is similar, but maybe slightly different. I don't know, Ms. McCauley, if you have sure. more you could add to that. Yes, Senator Wickland, Senator Utke. Um, it's complementary, I guess I would say. There's definitely crossover. These are just very specific um, three elements that were not necessarily in the Great Start Bill. Uh, there was a further element in the original draft of this bill um, around creating a competency framework or a cultural, uh, sorry, a comparable competency um, pathway for salaries that did get moved into the Great Start Bill. So these are the remaining pieces that relate to, and really they work all together to try to move our workforce forward. Um, Senator Atkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, again, I guess probably for a little of uh, your insight on this, is, is this something that will get laid over and you plan to mold a child care related package in the end? Uh, Senator Atkey, I, it would be part of the omnibus bill if we include items. It would be included in that. This particular bill, um, council believes that we should have it go to the Labor Committee because um, it has some references that are within its jurisdiction, but then I would, um, they would refer it back to us if, if we were to include components from this, so it would be, um, it would be sent back to us. Okay. Senator Atkey. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and yes, I did see that with the amendment. It uh, brought in the uh, Commissioner of the Department of Labor and Industry, yeah. so yeah. it'll make a stop and then come back. Okay. Correct. Yes, that's correct. Um, any other questions or comments, members? 
I, um, I'll just say I, I appreciate um, Senator Bolden, you bringing this bill forward. Um, I, I do think that we have to work on um, all of these issues kind of simultaneously if we're going to actually make progress for families to have uh, more access to um, more providers. We have to make the, the work um, suitably comp compensated to attract them into the field. And I think today there are incentive programs um, to get people into certain areas, but sometimes they won't include childcare workers because the profession um, doesn't, the compensation level is not high enough. So I think we need to do targeted activities to um, make sure that uh, as people are interested in this field that they can um, get take on the coursework and get the learning and, and not incur debt that, um, you know, if we haven't accomplished our goal to, to increase the compensation, um, that they'll be able to go, get out and into the workforce. So I appreciate Senator Bolden. Do you have any other comments? Uh, no, Madam Chair, other than I think that's exactly right. And, and that's uh, the bill aims to, to move us closer to that. So thank you. So um, seeing no other questions or comments, um, Senator Bolden, the motion would be that um, Senate file 2606 as amended be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Labor. Is that your motion? Yes, Madam Chair, so moved. Uh, members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And uh, the motion does pass or prevail. The Senate file 2606 as amended um, is passed and referred to the Committee on Labor. And Senator Bolden, you have one more bill. <laughs> Yes, Madam Chair. Thank you, members. So uh, we're going to go back to dental. Uh, so I am pleased to present Senate File 782. Um, and I want to um, start with a thank you um, to my co-authors, Senator Abler, uh, Senator Morrison, and Senator Utke. Um, So this is another um, way to try to get more dental care to more folks. And I'll just um, remind uh, members of my comments earlier just around how, um, you know, dental care, dental care really is part of healthcare, and and we have gaps in our state around ensuring that everyone gets the dental care that they need. Um, so this bill would um, reinstate uh, benefits, um, uh, would, re would provide the same Medicaid dental benefit set for all eligible, eligible Minnesotans. Um, in 2008, um, uh, benefits were decreased. So Minnesota currently has two different dental benefit sets for enrollees. There is one set for pregnant adults and children, and there's currently another set for non-pregnant adults. Um, and as I said, in 2008, the non-pregnant Medicaid benefits were significantly limited due to budget cuts. Um, and so while pregnant adults and children under the age of 21 um, experience uh, a certain set of benefits, many of our most vulnerable adult residents enrolled in Medicaid lack coverage of basic dental services. So this bill would reinstate that full set of benefits to non-pregnant adult Minnesotans. Um, and I do have an amendment for this bill as well, Madam Chair. Thank you. Yes, we have um, the pa the amendment, the A3 amendment was passed out. It's an author's amendment. Um, uh, Senator Bolden moves the A3 amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. The amendment is adopted. So, Senator Bolden, do you wish to go to your testifiers? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I just would add one more piece of information before I, we go to testifiers. Just as I referenced in the previous dental bill around how um, ensuring folks can get preventative dental care actually saves money uh, in the long run through avoiding um, emergency visits. Um, and we were able to get some um, actual data around this um, bill that in um, 2021, there was uh, $22 million spent on dental ER visits in Minnesota. And of that, $8.1 million was spent in ER visits from adults on the adult dental benefits that our, this bill covers. So that was one year. If you take that times two years, that's $16.2 million over biennium that could be saved by passing this bill. 
So with that, um, I'll go to testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, and I have Dr. Tim Holland. Uh, please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. <clears throat> My name is Dr. Tim Holland, and I am the president of the Minnesota Dental Association and a practicing dentist in Owatonna. I practice general dentistry in rural Minnesota and have been a Medicaid provider for the 26 years I have been in Owatonna. On behalf of our organization, I thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify on, file, on Senate File 782. The proposed legislation addresses one simple yet important matter, the restoration of an extensive set of adult dental benefits in our Medicaid program. Minnesota offers an extensive benefit for children and pregnant women, yet once that child reaches the age of 21 or once that child is delivered, benefits are severely reduced. The adult benefit, dental benefit set was cut in 2009 as a cost savings measure. While we appreciate the need for fiscal prudence, we must recognize that an investment in oral health is an investment in overall health. There is no doubt that oral health is an essential part of overall health. Countless studies have clearly linked the benefits of maintaining good oral health with good overall health. Access to dental care is often couched in terms of geography. An equally important factor, however, is access to a comprehensive set of dental services that can allow a provider to care for patients' oral health properly and comprehensively. So why do we limit dental services for adults? Studies have reported that spending can be significantly reduced throughout the Medicaid program when a holistic approach to care is embraced, inclusive of comprehensive oral health. Not to mention that access to proper oral health can reduce costly emergency room visits. These facts alone are evidence enough to see that the restoration of an extensive and comprehensive dental benefit is a wise investment in our Medicaid program. It is important to note that our adult population in Medicaid includes the elderly and the disabled. A comprehensive dental benefit can so positively impact the overall health and well-being of our most vulnerable residents, residents that are deserving of oral health benefits and services that are available to all other Minnesotans. A recent analysis by the American Dental Association's Health Policy Institute identified Minnesota as one of several states with a limited Medicaid adult dental benefit, while 21 states, including Wisconsin, Iowa, and North Dakota, provide extensive dental benefits. Minnesota provides itself as a leader in quality of life and health care delivery. Let's add oral health to that list. The MDA would like to thank Governor Walz for including this legislation in his administration's budget proposal and Senator Bolden for carrying this bill. Madam Chair and members of the committee, I urge you to support Senate File 782 and help restore necessary and comprehensive dental benefits to the elderly, disabled, and all other adults cared for through our Medicaid program. Thank you for hearing this important piece of legislation and I am happy to answer any questions from the committee. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Just here to answer questions, oh, Madam Chair. Okay. okay, members, do you have any questions about the proposal? What's this? Um, Senator Bolden, any other, any further comments about your bill? Uh, thank you, members. Just would encourage support. This would make a, a difference in, in the lives of folks across Minnesotans and would have a, a an impact on folks, both dental health and, as we heard, uh, their overall health. So would appreciate support. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, I think this. Um, there's a lot of evidence that this would really be very helpful um, to many people and save um, save money and um, extra time away from from work and and um, you know for people who have to deal with more severe oral health problems. So. Thank you for bringing it forward, and this bill is laid over for possible inclusion. And Senator Morrison, would you be willing to chair? Um, we're going to take up Senate File 2693 next, and that is my bill. And then um, we're, we're going to leave Senate File 2831 for another time if we choose to um, choose to take it up due to the length of time we've been spending here in committee. So,
Senator Wicklund, would you like to present your bill? Thank you, Senator Morrison, or Chair. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senate Files 2693 is a bill that relates to hospital payment rates. Um, think, and I appreciate um, being able to present this bill today. Um, this provides, this bill will provide timely updates to the medical assistance hospital inpatient fee-for-service reimbursement rate, rate-setting process at the Department of Human Services. Uh, specifically, this bill does two things. It ensures that required inflationary adjustments to hospitals, um, medical assistance fee-for-service rates, better reflect current patient care costs. And secondly, it ensures that all rural critical access hospitals are reimbursed at 100% of their actual uh, medical assistance fee-for-service patient care costs. And I have um, a couple testifiers here um, to speak on the bill. Um, Mary Crinky and Janet McCarthy. Ms. Crinky, will you please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. And for the record, my name is Mary Crinky, and I'm with the Minnesota Hospital Association. Um, this is the process known as rebasing. And um, every uh, two years, we are fortunate to get a little small increase in our medical assistance rates. We've been working with the Department of Human Services now for over 10 years. And, and it's been a great process. We've worked closely with them. They drafted the language of this bill. So I just wanted to share that with you all. Um, one of the things that has happened, as you all can imagine, inflation has increased greatly in the last couple years. And the Medicaid fee-for-service rates, and I want to be clear, this is only inpatient. This is only fee-for-service. This is not the PMAP uh, rates. This is just fee-for-service. And that represents about 30% of our inpatient patient patients. These are mostly all children or individuals with disabilities. And um, what's happened in the last few years, as you all know, costs have gone up greatly. And these are years that are five years old now, and so we're trying to capture a couple more years of inflation to bring those rates forward a little bit. So we're waiting for the fiscal note, but it's, it's pretty reasonable in that it's only inpatient, it's not outpatient, it's also just fee-for-service. And so obviously standing by for the fiscal note on this, um, just like many others. But um, we did bring one of our members with us today, Children's Hospital, and I'm here to answer any questions that members may have. So thank Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Janet McCarthy, and I am the manager for reimbursement and enrollment at Children's Minnesota. Thank you for the opportunity to join you today to express our support for Senate File 2693. Children's Minnesota is the largest pediatric health care provider in the state, serving more than 166,000 kids annually with emergency care, primary care, and more than 60 pediatric specialties. The number of Minnesota children depending on medical assistance for care is increasing in our system and in hospitals across the state. Currently, 51% of the patients we see in our hospitals and clinics are enrolled in Medicaid. And of those, about one third are fee-for-service Medicaid. The portion of our patients that rely on Medicaid has also been on a steady increase. Reimbursement rates for Medicaid are lower than the actual costs of providing care, typically covering about 70% of our cost. As a part of our mission, we do not turn away anyone seeking care, but this means that Children's Minnesota loses more than $100 million a year in uncompensated care. The proposed changes in Senate File 2693 ensure that Medicaid rates are calibrated more closely to the actual cost of care delivered by accounting for current inflation. This calibration is essential to our ability to continue to provide services to the communities we serve. Thank you, Senator Wicklin, for your leadership on this bill. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, any, any comments, Senator Wicklin, before we take questions. Okay, members, discussion, questions. Senator Utke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just a question for a testifier from Children's. The loss of $100 million a year is a big number. What, if you had a chance to figure out what this bill would do, how much that would help? Is it 
just move the needle a little bit or any idea? Ms. McCarthy. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Utney, I have not, um, but we could take that back. Okay, but at least it's moving in the right direction. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Other questions? Okay, seeing none, any final words, Senator Wickland? No, I just appreciate being able to bring the bill forward for consideration as we um, look at the different uh, ways that we can support, um, you know, needs in hospitals, um, <clears throat> along with other other key needs that we'll be looking at this year. So, thank you. Thank you, Senator Wickland. So, Senate File 2693 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Okay. With no further work before us, we are adjourned. <laughs>